Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Of all the names in ancient philosophy, Socrates is the most intriguing. Born in 469 BC, into the golden age of the city of Athens, his impact is so profound that all the thinkers who went before are simply known as pre-Socratic. In person, Socrates seems to have been deliberately irritating. He was funny and he was rude. He didn't like democracy and spent a lot of time in the marketplace, accosting citizens with questions such as what is courage or virtue or knowledge. He claimed he was on a mission from God to educate his fellow Athenians, but he's left us nothing in his own hand because he refused to write anything down. Plato, his pupil, wrote about and for him, and in doing so provided the pillar of Western philosophy. With me to discuss the elusive and mercurial Socrates are David Sedley, Lawrence Professor of Ancient Philosophy at Cambridge University, Angie Hobbs, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Warwick University, and Paul Millett, Senior Lecturer in Classics at the University of Cambridge. Angie Hobbs, as I mentioned, uh, Socrates didn't write anything down. Why didn't he write anything down? Well, that's what we're here to discuss. Uh, he, I think a clue comes from... Uh, a dialogue written by Plato, uh, a later dialogue called the Phaedrus. Plato, of course, knew Socrates well. And in the Phaedrus, uh, they discuss the dangers of the art of writing because books can't, you can't really discuss with a book. It can't answer you back. It can't really deal with your questions. So we know that Socrates thought that the ideal way to do philosophy was to uh, have a one-to-one conversation and take your interlocutor with you and you agreed on points together. However, of course, uh, a lot of his followers were extremely keen that his legacy should continue in some way. So they wrote a lot down uh, for him and and wrote dialogues with Socrates as one of the major characters. It shows a a commendable indifference to posterity, doesn't it? Uh, Well, it it does, but um, I think maybe he knew that uh, Plato and Xenophon and other of his uh, followers were going to, to write things down, so... Maybe he wasn't quite as indifferent as uh, we might think. So he thought that once it was written down, uh, there was no doing with it. It wasn't malleable, it wasn't plastic. It was set in the sort of stone that no idea should be set in. Possibly, and possibly this is why a lot of his followers chose to write in in these fictional dialogue forms. Uh, Maybe the idea is that... Reading a dialogue, we become characters in the dialogue ourselves almost, so we're part of the conversation. What do we know about him? Well, we know from some of his followers who knew him well, who did write, particularly Plato, the philosopher, and Xenophon, who was a retired military commander who'd known uh, Socrates well in his youth. And these are our two main sources from the lifetime of Socrates. Um, And all the sources agree, and there are many others, that Socrates was compelling, he was charismatic, he was self-controlled, he was self-contained, he was provocative, and above all, he was utterly unique. Absolutely nobody else like him. They all say that. Now, then things get interesting because... Though they all agree on those points, there are also some significant differences, particularly between Plato's and uh, Xenophon's portrayals. They're precise contemporaries almost, those two, aren't they? Yeah, Uh, yeah, well, they're young. Yes, indeed, indeed. Now, for Plato, Socrates is more ironic, teasing, more elusive, more provocative, Um, whereas Xenophon's is more conventional, he's more didactic, he's more approachable, he's chattier. He could, of course, have been both. He could have been both. Yes, it could be that uh, the historical Socrates was uh, even more complex than even Plato's portrayal and was very adept at uh, projecting different aspects of himself to different people. Or it could be that each author saw what they wanted to see in Socrates and focused on their own particular concerns, which, of course, would have been uh, uh, facilitated by the fact that the historical Socrates was so elusive. However, it does seem to me that because we know that many of the brightest people in Athens of uh, Socrates' day were so fascinated by him, it seems to me that Plato's portrait... uh, would probably have it, uh, be closer to the truth because it's Plato, Socrates, who would have exerted the greater magnetism, I feel. And also, I think Plato would have uh, had the philosophical gifts to appreciate uh, Socrates perhaps a little more than, than Xenophon. 
Thank you. And he was iconic in his own lifetime. David Sedley, <clears throat> what is the fact that he didn't write anything down? I want to pursue this a bit because I'm sure it'll intrigue our listeners, intrigues everybody. Tell us about his attitude to philosophy. I mean, if we can go a bit further into that. Yes, well, one can add another reason uh, as to why he didn't write anything down. Uh, it was conventional in his day to write a book setting out the wisdom that you had discovered. Socrates claimed that he didn't know anything. He didn't have un any understanding. Uh, he was still working on it, and therefore uh, he wasn't really in a position uh, to, to write a book. And his activity, his, phil his um, philosophical activity, was essentially an oral, interpersonal, interactive one. His method uh, uh, has come to be known as the elenchus, which means cross-examination or interrogation or quizzing. Uh, and uh, he, Plato regarded him as the founder of dialectic, which is really the science of finding, uh, working towards truth through question and answer. So what Socrates would do, typically, was uh, he would buttonhole somebody for a conversation in streets in Athens. He really uh, is supposed to have done this. Oh, yes. They found the agora that he wandered around buttonholing people. And saying, absolutely. What do you think of virtue as you're on the way to... Anyway, I'm not going to be... Trivial. Get into a casual said, conversation yeah, absolutely, yeah. and then... Uh, it would turn out that the person he was talking to uh, had pretensions to understanding some important concept, probably some moral value. And then Socrates will say, well, he would put himself in the weaker position uh, using his characteristic irony. Well, I don't understand this, but perhaps you could help me to understand it since you know so much more. Then he would ask the person to define the concept, but Socrates would say, but just a minute, um, don't you also think so and so, and doesn't that act if so... Don't, isn't that in conflict with your definition or doesn't the, co the definition have the following internal consistencies, inconsistencies uh, and that would lead to um, the interlocutor withdrawing the definition, maybe coming up with a better one that's the way progress co could occur um, Socrates' own uh, explanation of how this came about is a story he tells a friend of his called Chirophon went to the Delphic Oracle and said is uh, there anybody wiser than Socrates and the Oracle said no uh, Socrates, when he heard this, was absolutely baffled, so he claims, because he said, well, I don't understand anything, so how, how could there be nobody wiser than me? And he set out to test what the, what the oracle meant by going around questioning people who really did have pretensions to understanding, and every time he questioned them, it turned out that, that their pretensions were actually based on, 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 on some kind of misapprehension. So he said, actually, it, it turned out the oracle was right. I am the wisest of all people, or at least I'm a paradigm of what it is to be a wise human being, because... Uh, real human wisdom consists in nothing more than recognising the, li the limits of your own understanding, and that's contrasted with divine wisdom. He was on this mission to educate the people of Athens, wasn't he? It was, yes. a, it was very in his own lifetime, in his own day, the people of his own city. That was what he, he said he was out to do, and uh, that is what he, that's what he pursued. And you, you mentioned uh, definitions, and the priority of definitions seems to be something that is attributed to uh, Socrates as having not, not, not invented, but certainly established a, as, as, as a commanding place in philosophy. Can you just develop that a little bit? In, indeed. Uh, Aristotle, in fact, tells us that in his view, uh, the importance of definitions as one of Socrates' two contributions to uh, the development of philosophical method. It, it's, uh, it is a methodological point. Uh, Socrates takes the view that the most fundamental question you could ask about anything is what it is. If, if you don't even know what the thing is, you couldn't possibly answer any further questions. For instance, about courage it. is yes. one example. So let, let, let me take... Uh, um, courage is, is a good one, but let's just take the examples of uh, the question that Socrates gets engaged in. Uh, does justice benefit the person who possesses it? Or another one, is virtue teachable? Now, what Socrates says when those questions come up is, well, obviously I couldn't answer the question whether virtue is teachable until we first of all know what virtue is. Because, for example, if virtue is some kind of knowledge, then uh, there's a good case for saying it's teachable. If it's something other than knowledge, then there's a very good case for saying it's not teachable. So you always come back to the primary question, what is the thing, uh, before you, you, can, uh, you can actually move on to any, any of the, the, those other questions. Thank you. Paul Millett, uh, I've mentioned two or three times the agora, or marketplace, in, in Athens. Can you tell us, we're in 5th century Athens, we're talking about the Golden Age, it's a miraculous time in, in, in thought. Uh, can you tell us about this marketplace and, and why it was so important for Socrates? Indeed, yes. Well, uh, still there today in the centre of, uh, of Athens, there is this area of about 20 acres or so. You can walk through it in 10 minutes. Um, which is the Agora. Um, you called it in your introduction the, the marketplace. It certainly was that. 
Um, it was much more than that, though. It was the, the focal point of, 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 of public life in, in, in the city. So we have there the, uh, the admin uh, center, the public buildings. It's uh, a, a node of activity for religion, shrines. Um, there's the Temple of Hephaestus still there, the northern end of the Agora. It's also um, uh, a center for uh, justice. The, the law courts, many of them are there, including the court where Socrates himself was tried. We'll talk about that perhaps a bit, a bit later on. Um, but it's also where um, citizens gather together to interact in an intense kind of way. Uh, they'll go there to talk, um, argue, gossip, get the news, uh, get hired as casual labourers, find out the time from a water clock there, and of course do all their shopping uh, as well. So it wouldn't um, be unusual for somebody to approach somebody else and ask them so- Socrates wouldn't be the only person going around he isn't a lone figure in the Agra asking no, these questions. No, there are, there are lots of places where people would gather and, yeah. and, ha- and have discussions like this. Uh, we hear of Socrates, for example, um, at the bankers' tables, uh, looking for people to talk to and, and finding them as well. And also Socrates um, visiting various shops where, where people would gather uh, as a matter of habit to, to, to meet and talk. And then the various um, stoas or porticos, colonnades around the Agora, where people would gather and, and, and chat and, and discuss. Uh, So he's not the only person doing this. And I think just one point I I would make also is that it's not just citizens. The Agora is full of all sorts of different people, non-citizens, slaves as well, um, and women too, uh, non-citizen women and also women from poorer families who uh, would have to go out to to work. Um, We think of this, there's such a glow around uh, 5th century BC Athens, that we think of philosophers being at the centre of it, everyone walking around in, in stately washed togas and so on, and the philosophers being, as it were, the unacknowledged kings of the Agora. Was it like that? No, I'm sure not. I, and I, I, this idea of people wafting around in sort of, you know, bedsheets uh, around marble pillars, I'm sure, it, I'm sure the Agora was a noisy, vibrant lively, smelly, dirty kind of place. But what, uh, is it possible from the evidence that you have to give us some idea of the status and place of philosophers at that time? Were they a small cult elite, more or less ignored by most people, or where were they? You know, I, I think there's one good piece of evidence uh, that, that Socrates um, uh, and other philosophers were, were in, in the public eye. Um, I'm thinking of uh, this famous play by Aristophanes, a comedy called The Clouds, where, where Socrates is, is a main figure and is caricatured in, in, in that That's comedy. when Socrates was quite a young man, isn't it? Yes, he would have been, what, in his 40s, I think? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and, uh, it's not so just he's sent up by the greatest comic writer of the day in a way that was understood by the massive audience sure which went to right. those... Well, yeah. And that's, it's not just a one-off, because there mm. are other comedians who also we know brought Socrates into their, into their plays. Um, David Sedley, all the thinkers who went before Socrates, uh, there were many, were collectively referred to as pre-Socratic. Um, what were the pre-Socratics doing? <laughs> <laughs> what were they? I mean, for, I know they were doing lots of different things, but on the whole, because I want to get to the point in the next question, where was the breakaway, what is the great significance of Socrates? Just one more bit of context. What right. were they doing? They were asking the big questions about uh, the nature of reality, the structure of the universe... Uh, they were started, they, many of them were experts on astronomy, for example, because they thought that you couldn't possibly understand how the cosmos works unless you started with the, um, the laws un, un, underlying the heavens. So they were enormously diverse, a rather brilliant collection of, of thinkers, um, ex- all extremely independent. Um, and uh, really, they um, to, to, to many, for, to, to Heidegger, for example, and to Popper, they mark in, in some ways the high point of, of Greek thought. Angie Hobbs, so we come to Socrates. How, how, what was radical and new about him? Um, David, very in a magnificent elliptical way, given us pre, there's maybe more to say about pre Socrates, but we needn't. What, is, what did he bring that made him such a significant figure to significant figures like Plato and then to Plato to Aristotle and so forth to the present day? What was new? OK, well, I think Cicero puts it really well in his Tusculan Disputations. He says that Socrates was the first to bring philosophy down from the heavens and into the towns and into people's homes. Socrates is passion is for ethics. He starts off with what he believes is the fundamental question of life. How should life be lived? That's the question he asks again and again. And the answer he gives, which he assumes, perhaps wrongly, that everybody would assent to, is that life should be lived flourishingly, that it's flourishing or more 
less accurately, happiness is what we all want. Now, his next move is a much more controversial one because he then says that the flourishing life is, in fact, the virtuous life, which, of course, not all people would assent to. Various characters in Plato do not assent to that. Now, the reason Socrates gives for saying this, or one of the reasons, is that he thinks that the soul is far more precious than the body or than an external goods. Indeed, that nothing else, uh, neither an external such as wealth or even physical health, can do you any good unless you exercise it virtuously. So your soul is absolutely all important. Therefore, the virtuous life must be the flourishing life if you act viciously towards... Flourishing, can you just keep redefining that? I mean, it has a completely different meaning nowadays, so just let's bring us back yes, up to speed yeah, on that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the Greek word is eudaimonia, which means yeah. being blessed with a good daimon, and there is an element of subjective happiness and feeling good in it, but it's also a more objective concept than the one that we would have today. It's uh, connected, perhaps, with sort of actualizing your potential as a human being, with being a successful human being. So if you act viciously, if you hurt other people... You are, in fact, hurting yourself. It's completely entwined with virtue, isn't it? For Socrates, yeah, it is. That's for what so- we're talking for about Socrates. For, so Socrates, yeah. for Socrates, it is. Uh, that, this is his big move. That is, mm. He wants to say, we all agree that we want happiness, the flourishing life. And what I'm telling you is that you're not going to get the flourishing life unless you live virtuously, because otherwise you're going to be harming yourself more than the people you hurt, because you will harm your own soul. You can only hurt other people's bodies or their possessions. Only the agent can harm his or her own soul. That was his... His sort of his, that was the controversial claim. That was a, a radical claim. David, would you like to come in? Um, yes, the the uh, in, in fact that what Andrew's talking about there brings on to one of Socrates' most um, distinctive um, doctrines. He didn't have many doctrines. In fact, one of the, that was one of the puzzles about him. He asked questions, but he, it wasn't always clear what he thought himself. But one. Uh, doctrine that he's very emphatic about uh, is um, that that it's never in any circumstances right to harm another person. Mm. Uh, you should you should not return wrong for wrong. You should not return harm for harm. This rejection of retaliation he makes it quite clear is a rejection of a whole um, a moral tradition. Uh, so th- this is radical in a time in uh, when we think that the, the, the way to behave was to kill your enemies and the way to succeed was to massacre those who stood in your way. Exactly, and yeah. the, there's an obvious parallel to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the, uh, the, the the rejection of Old Testament uh, retribu- retributive morality in, in favour of turning the other cheek. is a very strong parallel in Socrates, standing against an existing tradition. Paul, <coughs> Paul Miller. David, the, the, am I not right that, in fact, Xenophon Socrates does speak in favour of retaliation. So that, that's correct. This is, uh, but uh, Plato, it, the evidence comes from Plato, yes. and there are often discrepancies like this. Mm. P- Xenophon's portrayal of Socrates is very much more as a conventional moralist, uh, and uh, it's hard not to think that uh, Xenophon portrayed Socrates to some extent in his own image, Xenophon being himself a rather conservative thinker. Uh, the evidence in Plato is so um, it, it's so striking, the way that Socrates just for once says, this is actually my position, my, my circle, and I have always agreed mm, on yes. it, it's sets us apart from the many, makes it, I think, pretty clear that this was actually a, a historical fact. So, so, so not just a Plato projecting not, himself back onto not, not at all, no. Mm. Can we rummage around a bit more with this idea of radical, which is, I, if, I don't know whether it's a useful word for that time, but, but I want to just establish now what was so distinctive and so influential. So can you, can you give us, can you put your two pennies in, Paul Miller? Mm, that, that is, that is a, 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 a tricky one. I, I think Angie's put it right, you know, exactly right. It, it, it's a different way of, of, of looking at, uh, at things philosophically, um, this idea of, of bringing philosophy into the streets. Uh, I, I must confess, David, I find the pre-Socratics pretty incomprehensible. Uh, I think Socrates time. did too. That was one of his points, actually. That the, uh, he said that uh, all this, stu- this talk about how, um, what makes the heavens move mm. and the, stru- the underlying structure of the world, um, he, could, he didn't understand it. It was completely unprovable. And anyway, he said it was a, a diversion from the questions that actually matter to us, which is how we're to lead our lives. So, so these are issues that he could discuss with ordinary people uh, on, yes. on the streets. Yes, well, I mean, Socrates has only just begun his radical mm. quest when he says that the, the happy life, the flourishing life, is the virtuous life, because he... he charges on from there because now we have to ask ourselves what he thinks virtue is and this is where he really branches off because his answer is that virtue is knowledge it is in some sense which we'll come on to in a moment knowledge of the human good um 
And as we've seen, that if you don't have knowledge of the human good, then no other apparent goods that you possess, such as health or wealth, can do you any good. Now, then he says, well, in fact, each individual virtue, such as temperance or justice or courage, is in fact united as one, as knowledge of the human good. And there's a very keen philosophical debate that still goes on about exactly what Socrates means by this thesis of the unity of virtue. Does he simply mean that all the individuals individual virtues are interdependent, you can't have one without them all, or does he mean something stronger, that all, vir all the virtues, all the individual virtues are in fact one thing, this one thing that's knowledge. Now, of course, the uh, counter of that, if virtue is knowledge, then we get to possibly his most radical claim of all, which is that vice is ignorance. It is simply ignorance. And he says that no one does wrong willingly, which I think will still surprise some, some of our listeners, and the weakness of the will is impossible. There can be no such thing as a conflict of desires. Uh, all you need to do is find out what the best thing for you as a human being is, and then if you know what that is, you couldn't fail to do it. You what is the best thing for you as a human being you think is to go and kill a lot of people? Uh, then that shows that you've not understood, Socrates would say, how precious your soul is to you. Right. He, um, he's not actually anti-war in Plato. Yeah, he, he thinks... A, he had a, he, he, and he goes... A war career, yeah. He does. He fights yeah, yeah. at Delium and Potidae and so on. Mm -hmm. David, certainly. Uh, but you don't do it for revenge. That's the point. No. Yeah. That's, that's right. exactly right. Uh, the, the Socrates' um, insistence that you, if you knew enough, you would always do the right thing <clears throat> in itself sounds terribly implausible. There's so many obvious counterexamples to it of knowing you shouldn't smoke this cigarette, but you, you give in, um, weakness of will prevails. Uh, but I think the reason why Socrates had such a powerful case was that the way he lived his own life seemed to prove it true. Socrates was quite extraordinary for, for his own power of, of mind over matter. There were, there were legendary tales of his, um, his, his courage, his fortitude, going barefoot in winter, putting up with all kinds of, of, of dangers, his total calm in the face of his impending death. It really seemed to people that Socrates had a level of understanding which did enable him uh, always to do the right thing without any kind of con conflict from his emotions. Paul, um, can we get a bit more context here? The 5th century BC, we talked about it, mentioned it's a golden age, uh, but towards the end of it, it was a very turbulent, uh, it, it was very turbulent for the Athenian democracy, yes. the Peloponnesian Wars, the Great War with Sparta, the crushing of the Athenian fleet in Sicily, and the plague that came to Athens, and so on and so forth. Um, can you just give us a bit, flesh that out a bit, and then say how that, how that, um, uh, how is it were made itself effective, made itself known inside the Athens that we're talking about? Well, if you say a golden age, but rather a tarnished golden age, um, uh, the last thirty years of the fifth century, uh, as you say, this great war with Sparta, which dragged on and on, plague, battle losses. Um, then, when the war is completely lost then the, the Spartans imposed on Athens this uh, brutal junta um, of 30 pro-Spartan oligarchs, the, the so-called 30 tyrants, um, who uh, ruled over Athens for a year or so. Uh, and then by uh, a remarkable series of events, democracy was restored in 403. And then four years later, Socrates is brought to trial. Uh, and I, I find it hard to believe that, that those awful events the Athenians suffered from didn't have some impact on what happened in, 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 in the court. In the sense that he was very, uh, he was very uh, anti-democratic and therefore could seem to be pro-oligarchic well, and therefore who could seem to yeah. be pro the 30 tyrants when, and therefore when the democracy came back he wasn't, uh, he wasn't with, the, with the movement. We've talked about the differences between <coughs> uh, Plato's and Xenophon's Socrates. In fact, one area, one of the few areas, I think, where, where they do converge or even agree <coughs> is over Socrates dislike, if not of democracy itself, certain key aspects of Athens' democracy, uh, public pay for poor people to hold office and selection of people to hold office by, by drawing lots. Um, both, uh, both Plato and Xenophon uh, make it quite clear that this did not meet with Socrates' approval. And because um, politics in, in Athens was very much polarised, oligarchs and democrats, if you weren't uh, obviously for one group, then you must be for the other. Yes, it's interesting how much he was deeply mixed up in, and that's the, it was, he was deeply mixed up in war, he was deeply mixed up in politics, he was deeply mixed uh, in, in philosophy, he was, he was around, around all those things. But 
let's move to the trial, and then we can talk about his influence. Mounted. Talk about David Sedley. Um, shortly after the end of this war and the resumption of uh, uh, at the end of the fifth century, you see, Russian democracy in Athens, he was put on trial. Um, do we know precisely why? Well, we know what the charges were. Uh, they were uh, w- corrupting the young uh, and. Uh, Denying the gods of the city while introducing new gods. Those are the official charges. Corrupting the young has often been to, uh, been taken to mean, uh, as it were, uh, encouraging homosexuality. Uh, not, not really, no, because uh, homosexuality was actually a normal uh, in, um, uh, in relationship um, in the kind of uh, in a male society that, um, that Socrates moved in. It's actually the idea was rather that by questioning basic moral values, he had um, he had actually undermined uh, the moral fibre of the young. As I understand it, charges were brought against people by individuals. Yes. So therefore, this could be uh, an act of uh, personal revenge. Or yes. Well, Socrates says in, in Plato's reconstruction of his, of his defence speech that he's made a huge number of enemies, and you can absolutely see why in the pages of Plato, where lots of people loathed him because of the way he undermined their, their public standing by the way he questioned them in front in front of their peers and, and their juniors. Uh, so because he th- actually demonstrated ignorance time after time after time mm-hmm. in his dialogue. Their ignorance. Th- their, their ignorance, that, yeah. that, that's exactly right. So it's completely understandable that the, that the three individuals who brought the charges should have, should have um, be done so out of personal motivation. Do you know anything more, Paul Millet, about these people? Well, um, we know a bit about one of them, one of the three accusers, a man called Anitus, who was uh, active as a democratic politician. Um, and uh, had been in exile when the tyrants were in control in Athens. Um, We also know that around the time of the trial of Socrates, there were a number of other political trials um, held uh, where where people who had uh, been on the oligarchic side um, at the time of the tyrants, uh, well, life was made rather difficult for them, shall we say, um, being brought to trial. Um, And I I think I would see Socrates' trial as, as part of that sequence, of, of, of trials. Angie Hobbs, we have this trial then. Um, the court is in one end of the agora, mm-hmm. isn't it? And, we, and they're still, you can see the benches now, as I'm. Well, well that is, that's well, let's leave that aside. Theory, that, yes. That's what I read somewhere, mm-hmm. but yeah. that doesn't matter either. either. That 501 of the citizens of Athens are the jury. It lasts for one day. The lawyers have, at the most, an hour each, as measured by the water clock, something we could reintroduce into this country with great effect, I think. And um, how. Did Socrates acquit himself, Angie Hobbs, at that trial? Well, again, it depends which source you um, put your faith in. If you go with uh, Plato's apology, he does give a magnificent, um, some might say rather high-handed, defence of philosophy and his life in Athens. He refuses to beg, he refuses to supplicate or ask for pity. He says in fact I think I have served Athens so well you should be paying me money, uh, well, not, you know rewarding me for what I have done. He absolutely will not grovel which of course would have got some people's backs up. Um, so I think he'd well some some of his friends thought he'd decided that He'd lived, you know, he was 70, he didn't want to sink into decrepitude and he wasn't too upset at the thought of of dying now. And certainly he ends the speech that uh, Plato puts into his mouth very magnificently, he says at the end, so I go to die and you to live and which of us goes to the better lot, uh, only God can know. Uh, Very moving, but also you can see a certain... Um, imperiousness about it, which might have rather annoyed some of the jurors. And he didn't put in a counterplay when they said you will be put. He was lying. You will be sentenced to death. He would. He could have said, uh, "Why not send me into voluntary exile?" He uh, could have put in a counterplay. No. You know, he didn't. He could have done. Paul will know more about the the factual Paul. details here than me. Yes, um, it was a kind of trial where um, the two opposing parties put forward uh, proposals for, for punishment. And Socrates' first punishment was, as Angie said, being maintained at public expense for the rest of his life, <laughs> uh, which was for Olympic <laughs> heroes and the like. Uh, and then um, uh, he offered a, a, a very modest fine, uh, but he did not propose exile, according to Plato.
Um, mm-hmm. In Xenophon's account, he, he refuses, I think, to make any proposal at all. Which account, David Sedley, do you come down on the side of? these accounts? I mean, do you think there's, a, there's a one coherent, trustworthy account, or are we forever stuck no, with... We're ever Socratic stuck with literature were, um, were, was burgeoning in the early 4th century BC, and, and uh, it, was, it was basically it was a branch of fiction, but it, uh, these people were writing as apologists for Socrates. Uh, so I, the, extracting the historical facts um, about the trial is probably a hopeless task. Uh, what we really have to say is we live, for better or worse, we live with Plato's account, because Plato's account is the one that carries his conviction he was determined he was there he was 25 years old or something like that that's well. right and he, he actually one of the only occasions when Plato mentions himself in his work is when Socrates mentions his presence at the trial um, in, in, in his, his defence speech so we, we because Plato has fixed the later tradition about Socrates we tend to go with it but do we really know that that was right no we don't Angie, and then Well, I, I actually want to, yeah, a, a question for Paul, mm. because there's a tradition from antiquity, which you, you'll know more about than me, that Socrates said nothing at his trial. Isn't, isn't there this, you know, that he, that he just said, said there no was word. silence, and it was Plato and Xenophon who desperately tried to put into his mouth the words they felt he should or would have said. Yes, in, indeed. Uh, and, of course, the discrepancies between, between Xenophon and, uh, and, and Plato about whether he had supporting speakers as well who spoke on, on, on his behalf. But if I might just speak very quickly, uh, the point about the, the site of the trial, I think is interesting. Mm. There are these stone benches at one end of the Agora. Um, there were, we think, five originally, could seat 500 people. It could be where the trial took place, just. Um, if so, it's right in the public domain. You, the, the jurors sat there looking out over all the noise and bustle, the arguing, the bargaining. Behind them on the hill there, there were the uh, bronze founders' workshops. You know, this, this is justice, as it were, in the community. Uh, and the jurors, would, 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 the jurors would, would be thinking all the time, my decision will affect all that's going on around me here. I mean, silence in court was not a concept the Athenians would have, would have understood. Uh, shall we just briefly refer to the actual death and then move on to the influence. David Sedley, could you tell us through the actual death of Socrates? He, he refused. It's curious that he wasn't crucified because people were then. Th- that would have been an option. He was lucky he got hemlock instead. Mm. Uh, and uh, the, he, uh, it, the, the description in Plato is, is of a very calm Socrates, drinking the hemlock, all his friends fall about weeping, but he's, com- he's completely calm throughout. Uh, and, the, and the effect of the hemlock, as Plato describes it, is gradual paralysis from the feet up. Uh, there has been some d- modern dispute about whether this is actually um, medically correct or not, uh, and it turns out it all depends which variety of hemlock was used, and there is a variety which would have produced those effects. <laughs> <laughs> so they could have been right after all. Uh, they, yes. <laughs> Let's try to let's try to discuss his his influence. Do you want to get a quick word? Yes, because it, it does seem to me from Plato's Phaedo, where we get this account of uh, Socrates' death, that you also get a more unattractive side of Socrates coming in here. There's a, there's a chilliness, it seems to me. He banishes even his wife from his death scene and all the other women folk because they were weeping and wailing, and he wanted everything calm, and I would say sort of male. Um, and well, why don't we stick with calm just as once? Uh, well. It is significant that all the women are banished from the prison yes, cell. There's no doubt that one of the many things that we will find yeah, to prove about Socrates is, is, is his attitude to women. He, he was or, not, I don't think, but a particularly good make, husband. It, there's no reason to think he was untypical of his no. male coterie. And, and he sort of says, well, I'm going to die, but that's OK, because, you know, I'll find, if, if there is a, an afterlife, I'll find people there to sort of discuss with everything. My friends are replaceable, is basically what he says. Mm. And I, I find that ra- rather chilling. You're nodding. Do you find it chilling too? Yes, yes, I do, uh, indeed. Uh, I, I just say, that if I make to go back to the uh, poison by hemlock, I think even the sort of nice, kind poison uh, sounds pretty horrible, that you, uh, you die through suffocation. Uh, you know, I, I find it hard to believe it would have been quite as, as calm as, uh, as Plato suggests. It's true, but Socrates was notable for his, his, ability, his control over his own body. For example, he could drink gallons of alcohol and remain sober. And I think well, this is so on the Plato tells us, of course, yes, <laughs> in a symposium. Part of the same portrayal. <laughs> There's no reason why Plato... I mean, you, we keep saying, so Plato tells, so Plato tells. Plato was writing to people who had known Socrates. I, I just, this is en passant, but there's not much reason for him to lie. And if he would lie, wouldn't somebody say, look, you're telling untruths? Because I knew him as well, and he, he, he didn't drink at all. I mean, uh, so I think you, you have to sort of begin to be, believe some of well, the stuff Plato y- yes, yes and no. I mean, look, my, my analogy here is, is Thucydides, who is a, an earlier contemporary of Plato, a historian. And Plato, uh, sorry, Thucydides, can invent speeches which he puts in people's mouths. 
Now, a historian can do that. I have no problem with a philosopher doing the same sort of same sort of thing. Yeah, speeches is one thing, but the, the things that he did uh, and that people would know about, mm. they would know that Socrates was a soldier. They would know sure. that he did the agra. Uh, they, they might know that he could drink a lot or did drink a lot or whatever. They would know that he went around barefoot in winter. So I think, anyway, there you go. No, there's, Can there's we talk, quote. David Sedley, about, begin to talk about his influence, first of all, on the classical world, the influence of Socrates' philosophy through the dialogues of Plato. And Plato wrote dialogues to, to imitate the style in which Socrates had conducted his philosophy, as I understand it. Ex exactly, yes. Uh, I think that Socrates' philosophical influence, well, first of all, it was ubiquitous, but it was different on Plato from his influence on other thinkers. Plato clearly takes the view that Socrates... Uh, represents stage one of the process of enlightenment. Socrates had to come first before Plato in order to clear away all the, um, the, the, the misconceptions and all the pretensions to knowledge which were actually ill-founded. Then that left a vacuum that Plato, with his own philosophy, was, was able to go on to fill. Uh, but uh, for other thinkers, and there were many, many philosophers who called themselves Socratics and uh, claimed to be followers of Socrates, particularly in the 4th century BC, but carrying on to the, the Stoics from 300 BC onwards. For them... Socrates had already um, must, must have already achieved full enlightenment because uh, that was the only way of explaining why he led the perfect philosophical life and therefore the project for all these Socratic philosophers in his wake was to find out what it was that Socrates understood that enabled him to live that life and then there were competing views about it the usual view was one that goes, comes back to something that Angie talked about which is that uh, the, the, the one, either the one good or the, or the only important good is, um, is wisdom, um, that the, 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 if you know enough, then then not only does nothing else matter, what happens to your body or possessions doesn't matter, um, uh, but also you will always do the right thing. So th that was a, a recurrent theme in schools that called themselves Socratic and, and became indeed one of the main bases of Stoicism. Uh, but there were other view there were many other views about what the secret of Socrates' life had been that other, philosoph other philosophical schools developed. And just to give you one example, uh, in from a, um, the third century BC onwards, uh, the school founded by Plato, the Academy, became a sceptical school. It was devoted to showing that knowledge claims can never be firmly established. All, quest all philosophical questions must uh, um, admit of, uh, of two opposed points of view. They, they can never be closed down. And that, was that they regarded as being the real message of Socrates. Socrates was the person who showed you you, sh you can never rest content uh, with your beliefs, um, w w the, the beliefs you currently hold, every question must be constantly reopened and re-examined. So that was a uh, that was in the, uh, in their view that was the message of, uh, of Socrates, and that was what made Socrates' life an exemplary life. Do we see, Angie Hobbes, do we see the, the, the influence of Socrates uh, through Plato, we're now being going to talk about Plato more than Socrates, uh, beaming right through philosophy and Western thought and setting the pattern for Western thought, not in philosophy but in other areas uh, of knowledge, for until for uh, a couple of thousand years? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's masses more we could say about Plato who, who does also um, move on from some of Socrates' views and complicates the psychology and the theory of action and so on. Yes, if we take, for instance, in the Renaissance uh, for Montaigne, the, the sceptical humanist Montaigne, um, Socrates was a hero, and Montaigne... Uh, paraphrasing the, the quote from Cicero that we looked at earlier about uh, Socrates bringing philosophy down from the heavens and into people's homes. Montaigne says that Socrates has done humanity a great favour because he's shown how we can try to work out how to live the good life for ourselves without relying on gods or religion or tradition. Um, we can have a bash at this ourselves and, and Montaigne is hugely impressed by that. Um, and then, oh yes, you've got Hegel in the um, in his history. Uh, for, for him, he he sees Socrates as making this huge turn again from cosmology uh, and physics into ethics. Of course, uh, Socrates is a hero of Kierkegaard's concept of irony, uh, which is subtitled uh, in reference to Socrates. But for me, the most interesting character is Nietzsche because Nietzsche's. Uh, his overt sayings are hugely hostile to Socrates, right from the very early birth of tragedy, which I think is, is 1872, right up to Twilight of the Idols, which he writes a year or two um, before he allegedly goes mad. Um, 
and he's for Nietzsche, Socrates is this chilly, life denying rationalist who is anti tragedy, he's anti music, he's anti the instincts, he's anti all the things that Nietzsche thinks affirms life. However, Nietzsche always admits that Socrates holds a fascination. And of course, he shows how fascinated he is by the fact he keeps returning to him. And what Nietzsche and Socrates share is turning philosophy into a personal life quest. Paul Miller, do you think that Socrates is more as important as an icon as he is as a thinker? The man who pursued philosophy uh, all his life, he did it without gain, he did it and nothing else, and this was, and he did for the moment, for the present, with people he met and could talk to. Yes, but I'm speaking as a, as a historian, and I, when I, when I agree with that, yes. Um, I think so large is our sort of hinterland of ignorance about Socrates uh, that he, he can be appropriated for all sorts of purposes. David Sadley. Um, yes, no, I think that, uh, uh, th- that that's right. He is, uh, everybody can create, recreate Socrates um, in, in their own image uh, or to suit their own agenda. But it does seem to me that, although Socrates has, there are many ways in which he is uniquely um, inspiring and influential in the history of philosophy. But I think the most important single thing is that he is the person who put on the map the idea that philosophy needn't just be an academic discipline. It, it can actually be about how you lead your life. In fact, Socrates, perhaps his, his most inspiring saying on this, as recorded by Plato, is um, that uh, spending, taking time out every day to discuss questions of basic values, the ones that shape your life, is the best thing you can do to improve your own life. And as he puts it, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. Angie Holmes, do you think, would you think there's any, any, any conflict between Socrates as an icon which overtakes Socrates as as a philosophical influence? Um, as an icon, he can be a bit dangerous. Um, I think he absolutely stands up as a philosopher in his own right. We don't need to Why make... Do you think he's a bit dangerous as an icon? Because people can make him into such a, a perfect human being that, in a sense, yeah. he loses his influence and we, we stop thinking that we could really learn anything from him for ourselves. And I think that would be to do him a great disservice. He, he uses very simple, non-jargon language. He uses very simple metaphors. He wants us every day to think, how can I best live my life? What sort of person should I be? And as David said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, thank you for examining Socrates' life. Sorry about that. Very obvious. So we thank you very much, Angie Hobbs, David Sedley and Paul Millett. Uh, we'll be back next week uh, with, the, on this, with the subject of antimatter and why its absence from the universe is baffling physicists. Uh, but <laughs> thanks very much for listening. Good morning. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.